thank you so much, uh, Jenny, and thank you everyone for being here this evening, uh, this morning for me, evening for you. Uh, it's really, uh, truly a, a pleasure to be with all of you, uh, see your faces as well. I hope to uh, get to meet you uh, one day, whether in, in England or uh, maybe a World Congress or ADR or here in the US. So um, the talk I am presenting today has the intention of, of being um, a moment of introspection. Uh, of being something that we consider as possibilities, but not possibilities just uh, uh, for the intellect or for the mind, um, just a piece of knowledge um, that we we may um, just gather or put in a drawer. Uh, the intention is that we look at this uh, information and see how it relates to ourselves and to our spiritual journeys. So I will share with you a PowerPoint uh, to make it a little bit more entertaining and, and also to share some of the um, knowledge and the teachings that have been useful to me. So this is about, like Jenny said, uh, three paths of inner unfoldment. And what inspired this talk can be summarized and what this was, what Hildegard of Bingen, the, the Christian mystic said, I cannot uh, attest of uh, what, in what context she was saying this, what experience she was having when she said it, but it can certainly be applied to what I felt um, and she said, we cannot live in a world that is not our own, in a world that is interpreted for us by others. An interpreted world is not a home. So the, what inspired this research that I did was the realization that unless the spiritual life, the spiritual path, is genuine and feels true to us and at every step, um, it may not have an impact in the inner worlds. It may not have a real impact. Um, and for that, it may not become a real path unless we feel with every fiber of our being that this is where I belong, this is my home, whether it is uh, I feel at home when I'm reading. I feel at home when I practice. I feel at home when I meditate or pray. Um, and this relates to me at the point and at the level in which I find myself right now. And this will become clearer as we move um, through some of the things I want to share with you today. So before we, we talk about the three paths and what they are and how they apply to us, I, I want to point out the importance of three things that, to me, experience is irreplaceable. Um, and experience comes in a process that perhaps begins with knowledge then follow is followed by practice and from that practice experience arises so as an example um, we can have a person who has been playing the violin for 40 years and in that playing there is this this level this profound level of understanding of the instrument of the notes of the relationship between the person and the instrument, of the wood, of the conditions of humidity in the air and how that, that affects the instrument. Also, uh, the relationship of play in it and, and being present. So after imagining, after 40 years of playing the violin every day, what the experience has brought to that person, that is irreplaceable. 
and that is unique to the to the musician as well. So um, it would be very different if someone comes and says, "Oh, yes, I know about I know how to play the violin. I have read a book about it." So I want to point out the difference between the living experience uh, of that and and the knowledge that may may come first. One of the another important aspect of this work is that the mind tends to um, cling on the things we like and or understand or that are important to us. Um, but sometimes it also clings to knowledge that came from our upbringing, that um, knowledge that we have acquired uh, in various forms, and that creates structures uh, and forms. And for this process, if, if this is a, you know, when this becomes an internal process of, of discovery, it is important to important to hold on to any definition that we may have about God, whether personal or impersonal, whether um, transcendental, imminent, um, or or concrete. And the third one, and probably the most important one of the three, is that I would like to begin by pointing out that each one of us. Each one of us longs for something. On the surface, that longing may look like we want many things, but if we carefully remove one by one the things that are on the surface that we, we seem to want, underneath those, there is one profound, deep longing for something. If we look even closer, we will see that that longing takes the shape of a word or an image. Some people may say, what, we long, what I long for is to know God. What I long is for love or to know love. What I long for is awakening or so and so on and so forth. But for, for I, I invite you to, to look within and see for yourself, what is it that you truly, truly long for? The word that comes from that longing is going to give you a key of where is your strongest um, in temp where how your temperament, how your inner temperament is shaped. Uh, so um, what is most important to you? What is the strongest tendency within you? So we in the in the in the Hindu philosophy in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, several forms of yoga are presented, and each chapter talks about a different type of yoga. Yoga in this philosophy uh, means union. It's referring to the moment in which uh, we come to the realization that we are one with everything. And there are many, many paths that take us to that union, to that realization. We can say that truth is one. But the path to that truth are many. And like one theosophist pointed out, uh, I.K. Taimi, he said, it doesn't matter through which door we enter into the path because nobody stays at the door. And I thought that was very um, clever. So the, the book can be even though, as I'm mentioning, uh, we can see that uh, there are several yogas uh, mentioned in the book, uh, there are three major ones or three major paths. Uh, they are called margas. And the word dharma is very connected to um, this subject because 
according to who we are at this moment and our level of unfoldment and the longing that I was talking about before, we may belong to one of these margas. But as we're going to see at the end of the talk, uh, even though we may have predominantly a tendency, it is important for us to unfold and develop all of them. However, that one predominant tendency that we have is very important and it's going to help us a lot in the process of unfolding. So these, uh, as Annie Besant, uh, then Annie Besant wrote a book about um, these three paths and she called the book, The Three Paths to Union with God, uh, which can also be said, you know, in so many other words, the three paths of awakening, the three paths um, of realization. And she says, three paths have been traced by the sages along any one of which a person may tread and by following may attain liberation. Three are the paths, and yet in a sense they are but one. Differing in their methods, their end is one and the same. Different in their external conditions, they all lead to the one self. So the, the goal is the same, but we may approach the path from different angles. And these angles are different and they, they matter. So the these three paths are the path of wisdom or the Jnana Marga. It also called it is also called the, the path of knowledge. The second one is the path of devotion or the, the bhakti marga, uh, the path of love. And the third path is um, the karma marga or the path of action or the path of service. We're going to begin by the path of wisdom, the jnana marga. And I think within the Theosophical Society, this is the path that most people are familiar with because it is the path that was presented uh, by our spiritual founder, Helena Blavatsky. Um, her approach to the spiritual path was jnana yoga. And that was the reason why she wrote, um, one of the reasons, uh, she wrote the secret doctrine with the intention that people may tread this path. So what are the characteristics of jnana yoga? This is a path that will lead us through the unfoldment of the higher mind. I mean, theosophy, we talk about um, mind as one, but mind as dual. There is a part of the mind that identifies with what is temporary, you know, with our personality, we say. And there is a part of our mind that is capable of holding or, in, uh, uh, or receiving um, this, our spiritual nature. So the Jnana Marga intends to unfold um, our intellect to the highest degree in which we may be able to eventually transcend it and conceive that which is beyond the mind. So HPB, uh, for short of HP Lavasky, uh, wrote The Secret Doctrine, and she explained um, to her students that The Secret Doctrine was written um, to share with humanity um, some of the, the teachings that have been held secret, but also as a, as a form of yoga, so to speak. So she gave uh, suggestions on how to read the secret doctrine. And we will go into that in, in a moment. I want to uh, first share with you what she says in volume one. She says the whole essence of truth cannot be transmitted from mouth to ear, nor can any pen describe it, not even that of the recording angel, unless man finds the answer in the sanctuary of his own heart, in the innermost depths of his divine intuitions. 
So she's saying, you know, my understanding of what she's saying here is that truth um, can be found, but it's not something that can be read in a book. It can be pointed out to word, like sometimes they say is the finger pointing to word, that truth. Uh, and, that, uh, and, and that truth cannot, cannot be described. However, it can be found, it can be experienced, it can be perceived. So in the path of Nyana, we are trying to awaken our, the divine intuition. And we do that through a very particular way of studying, a study that challenges the limits of the concrete mind, a study that forces us to perceive what's beyond the form, go into the formless. So you'll see that when you read the Sutra Doctrine, um, many of the passages are challenging for the concrete mind because they are um, of a nature that that is shapeless, that is uh, of the higher mental uh, planes, as we say in Theosophy. Now, this path, the path of knowledge or the path of wisdom, may not be for any everybody. And in fact, I mean, several of the books uh, that you find in the Theosophical Society begin by saying, for the few, uh, for those who um, try, <laughs> and so on. Uh, because the, the path of, uh, of wisdom is, is really for a minority. At least this has been said by, by Annie Besant and others. She says, uh, this is a path trodden by the min minority only, uh, and it's encumbered with special dangers for those who have not accomplished the preliminary steps of purification. And so what is very important in this path is purification. Purification of what? In the path of wisdom, as we walk along trying to understand these teachings, these, um, this knowledge, we may feel at a very early stage that we know, and that um, instead of dissolving our sense of separation, it, um, it may do the opposite. It may um, strengthen our sense of ego or egoism, our, our sense of separation. So knowledge has that um, double, it's like this double-edged sword in which you know, it can be the bridge to the beyond. It can be the bridge to the spiritual intuition, but it can also make us feel proud, make us feel, I know, um, and, and I'm superior for that. So purification in this path is of fundamental importance and is the purification of the mind that feels itself as separate from the rest. So any type of... Um, Egoism uh, and sense of, of separation has to be eradicated from, from ourselves. So she continues to say that neither the path of karma uh, nor the path of bhakti um, have the, the same dangers um, of misunderstanding or the same likelihood of confusion and the, the same possibility of going utterly wrong. So it is, a, it is a dangerous path, but with the guidance that was given by HPV and others, it is uh, a path that many have uh, walked. So HPV says uh, to render active the, the inner vision, this vision that I was talking about, our, our communication with, with our spiritual intuition, the student must purify their whole nature, moral, mental, and physical. So there is a purification of the body, which means um, being very careful with you know, what we eat and what we drink, um, a purification of the mind, being, being very aware of our thoughts, and constantly trying 
to think of higher loving and inclusive thoughts. And also those thoughts that I was mentioning before, the thoughts that push the mind to the limit of what can be understood or put in form. And also the purification of, of, of our moral nature. So purity of mind, um, she says this of, of greater importance than purity of body. And if the upadi, the, if the vehicle, this, this mind, is not perfectly pure, it cannot preserve recollections coming from a higher state. So what she's saying here is that if for the mind to become a vessel, it has to be pristine. Otherwise, it cannot retain the, the influence of, of the spiritual intuition that is constantly being poured into us. So what is the process of acquiring higher knowledge? Uh, J.J. Van der Lue, who was a member of the Theosophical Society who passed away uh, quite early in his life, wrote a, a couple of wonderful books. And, and in one of them, he says, that it is necessary that we should clearly distinguish between the higher mind and the intellect. And we can say the higher mind and the lower mind, as we sometimes call it in theosophy. And never attempt to use the intellect as a way to knowledge about things which belong to the higher mind. If we, as is sometimes done, drag the things of the higher mind down to the level of the intellect, the result is a distortion of truth, even though it may present itself as a beautiful logical system fitting perfectly. So, Here's the description of how we normally, the average person, works with the intellect, this, with this lower mind. And because this is where we live most of the time, when we encounter spiritual knowledge, we tend to drag it into what we know, into the known, and into the personal, into the concrete, into the temporary. And what the teaching suggests, and also the whole method of HPV that HPV presented, is completely the opposite, is for the, for the mind to make the effort to try to conceive that which is unconceivable, that which is beyond grasp. Eventually, the radiant mind is developed. Uh, there is a, a term that is called, that is taijasi, which means radiant. And that comes as a consequence with the union with our buddhic nature, which is um, in terms of vibration, you know, it's, it's, it's a type, it's of a higher type of vibration than the vibration of the mind. It is something that is beyond understanding. The Buddhic nature is, is said to be um, what encapsulates the spirit. It is what makes the ocean a drop. That is, uh, the Buddhic nature is the vehicle of Atma, the vehicle of spirit. So when the mind and the Buddhic nature come in contact with one another, there is spiritual knowledge. There is direct perception of truth as it is. So Blavatsky in the Kichi Theosophy says, Taijasi means the radiant in consequence of its union with Buddhi. Manas, the human soul, illuminated by the radiance of the divine soul. So therefore, Manas Taijasi may be described as radiant mind the human reason lit by the light of spirit. The way I see these paths is that they unfold as we practice. And we don't only practice when we read uh, or when we are in interaction with others. We, we practice also in meditation or, or contemplative uh, prayer. And what are the practices that are related to jnana yoga? 
as I mentioned before, the study of the secret doctrine in the way that was um, recommended by HPV, which was holding fast to four fundamental ideas. And take a look at these four fundamental ideas and how they challenge our um, concrete mind, how they try to push our mind into that which is formless. She says, as we read this, this book, we have to hold in the background at all times the idea that there is only one being, the fundamental unity of all existence. There is no dead matter. Everything is alive. But the human being is the microcosm of a macrocosm. And the great hermetic axiom, which is, as it is above, so it is below, as it is um, inside, so it is inside, uh, as, as, as it is the big, so is the small. But then it says, there is no above or, or below, there is no inside or outside, there is no big or small. So see how this is, uh, the reflection and the meditation on these things can take us to um, a sense of the eternal as light on the path would say. So another meditation could be the meditation on the nature of the self, on the nature of the one self or that one being. And certainly the diagram of meditation that HPV left uh, is, is in a practice of Jnana Yoga. Now moving into the path of devotion, the Bhakti Marga, uh, the best ways of knowing about the Bhakti Marga is to go directly into the mystics, the mystics of the different religious traditions. I, I could say that uh, Jalaluddin Rumi, the, the Sufi poet and mystic, is the king of, of the Bhakti Yoga, the king of the path of love. And I want to share this poem, poem with you because it really describes what the bhakti path is about. Just for a moment, consider, before I read the poem, consider what you know about love, what you have been able to experience as a human being of what love is, what the nature of love. Think for a moment if you, of, of a person that has allowed you to know what love is, whether um, because you love them unconditionally, or you were loved unconditionally, or you were, or you experience a sense of deep connection, a sense of being home, or being completely seen. Or, or being fully accepted. So that feeling that arises when we conceive love in the way that we can perceive it at this point, that is the path, that feeling that we, that we sense is what the bhakti path takes and then expands so, so widely and deeply until it touches the very heart of the one being. So this is a love that may begin more towards something that is personal, but then eventually may grow into something much wider, much bigger, much more expansive. So uh, Rumi says, being a lover, because if the Bhakti Yogi is, is a lover, someone who loves. Being a lover means your heart must ache. No sickness hurts as much as when hearts break. So this is talking about a knowing of a love that can be painful in when there is absence of it. The lover's ailments totally unique. Love is the astrolabe of all we seek. Whether you feel divine or earthy love, ultimately we are destined for above. 
to capture love, whatever words I say, make me ashamed when love arrives my way. And I want to stop here before I read the, the, the other part. So whether, whether this is, it doesn't matter what kind of love it is, as long as we begin to unfold this love within ourselves, ultimately we are destined for the biggest love of all. And to capture love, whatever words I say, uh, it's like love cannot be described, as I was mentioning before when it came to knowledge that transcends understanding. Love as well transcends understanding. So anything that we can say about love is nothing compared to the experience of love. So he says, while explanation sometimes makes things clear, true love through silence only one can hear. The pen would smoothly write the things it knew, but when it came to love, it split in two. A donkey stuck in the mud is logic's fate. Love's nature, only love can demonstrate. Sunshine reveals its nature in each ray. So if it's proof you want, just look this way. So this is an invitation to know love within ourselves and to turn toward that feeling that we were trying to evoke a moment ago, again and again and again. So how, how does this happen? Some, um, when you read theosophical teachings, and as I was describing before, people tend to think that the only path is the path of the jnani. But there are many paths, like I'm pointing out. And in the path of bhakti, it is not the mind that reaches toward the formless. It is the heart, it is the love within us that reaches uh, towards the highest. And how can this happen in, in theosophical terms? You know, I read the mystics and I was trying to figure out how did they do it? How did they rise into the Buddhic level, into the Buddhic realm, um, seemingly not passing through the unfoldment of the higher mind. And I looked everywhere in theosophical literature to find something that could give me an answer, and I found, finally found it. In talks on the path of occultism, uh, C.W. Ledbetter says the following. He says, through, through the higher emotions, such as strong affection, devotion, or sympathy, it is possible to awaken the Buddhic principle to a great extent. It's, it's possible to awaken this, um, this encapsulated spirit without developing especially the intermediate causal body. In the theosophical teachings, we call that that higher mind, that the higher mind may express itself through this vehicle that we call causal body, or some theosophists call causal body. So um, I'll read that again. It is possible to awaken the Buddhic principle to a great extent without developing especially the intermediate causal body, yet not without affecting it, since all Buddhic development reacts very powerful on the, on the causal. The method of working um, of most of our students is to use the higher emotions and work from them upon the Buddhic vesture. I do not mean that they are yet developing a Buddhic vehicle in which they can permanently live. That would be an eminently desirable thing to do, but it, it is perhaps beyond the reach of most as yet. 
but the use of the higher emotions unquestionably evokes vibrations in the buddhic matter. It stirs up the as yet unformed buddhic vehicle so that many of its vibrations come down and brood over the man's astral body, emotional body. Thus, one may gain a considerable amount of influence from that plane before the vehicle is at all fully developed. This, in simple, this may be helpful for people who've been studying theosophy for many years. Um, in simple terms, it means that our emotional nature, when it aspires to love unconditionally and selflessly, can also create the vibrations that attract the spiritual nature. So the main objective of this path is cultivating selfless love. The many, um, if I really recommend that if you are interested, if you feel that you resonate with this path, that you read the mystics. There is the description of the devotional path can only be described by someone who has experienced it, as I was saying before, with the violin. So St. Teresa of Avila said something very simple and so important. She said, if you want to make progress on the path of this bhakti yoga path and ascend to the places you have longed for, the important thing is not to think much, but to love much. And so to do whatever best awakens you to love. So as you can see here, there is a contrast. There is really a contrast between the one path and this one. The, the emphasis is not on thinking. The emphasis is not on trying to reach a um, higher understanding of anything. The whole emphasis is on love. And to do whatever best awakens us to love. I remember the first time I read this and I thought, how is it that no one ever asked me before, what awakens you to love? I thought it was a brilliant question. We ask ourselves so many other questions of like, um, you know, what are your interests? Uh, what do you think is would be your career? Um, um, what kind of hobbies uh, do you, you know, you like to engage yourself in? Um, and so many other questions that people tend to ask and parents tend to ask. But I wonder if, you know, if more parents would ask their children, what awakens you to love? And, and to quote another, another mystic, uh, Brother Lawrence, uh, he wrote, Actually, he didn't write this. This was compiled for him. These are, these are little letters that he wrote. The Practice of the Presence of God. It's a phenomenal little book that explains the, the Bhakti Marga as well. And he says, if you would go forward in the spiritual life, you must avoid relying on the subtle conclusions and fine reasoning of the unaided intellect. Unhappy are they who seek to satisfy their desire therein. The creator is the great teacher of truth. We can reason laboriously for many years, but fuller, far and deeper is the knowledge of the hidden things of faith and of himself, which he flashes as light into the heart of the humble. And um, this quote in particular, I think it was important because when you read passages of what happens in the jnana path, in the path of wisdom, you will see that there are flashes of knowing that come to us. They could come in dreams, they could come in visions, they could come in moments of silence. You know, these flashes of understanding, these flashes of insight. And through the path of, of bhakti, 
um, that can also be attained, and it's attained through love, through the greatest expansion of love. We begin to then receive the knowledge. So, um, what do we love in this path? What, how do we cultivate this love? And it can really literally be cultivated in any way. What matters as Taimi, uh, I.K. Taimi says in self-culture, in the book Self-Culture, um, in the light of, the, of occultism, he says what matters is the intensity of the love. And of course, we're talking about real love. We're talking about unconditional selfless love. And Annie Besant in the, the Three Paths to You Know We Got, she says, think for a moment of the strongest, purest, noblest, intensest love that you have ever felt for a human being. And that is the beginning of it. This is the beginning. And this love in this path tends to be poor toward the teacher, sometimes toward the guru as well. And it can also be um, felt for a, a divine um, or, or a deity made more tangible in, in a personal way. As, um, as Taibi also shares with, that in, uh, with us in another book that is also highly um, recommended, Self-Realization Through Love, which talks about the Yoga Sutras, I'm sorry, the Bhakti Sutras of Narada. And, and this is uh, the Bhakti Sutras of Narada talk about self-realization through love. So he says, there is only one reality with its two aspects transcendental and manifest so uh, the divine can be transcendental or manifest whether we direct our devotion towards a personal god in the form of a symbolic representation of some of his attributes or an incarnation in a human form or we worship him in his impersonal aspect it does not matter so sometimes as theosophists, we, we want to tell people how to conceive God. Uh, I have experienced that myself. It says, um, we want to tell people, no, don't. Um, conceiving God in a personal way is very limited. Uh, God is, you know, it's absolute, boundless, timeless, um, and so on. And uh, through time, I have realized that the best thing that we can do for someone is to let them choose the form or the formless way of relating to God. Because that is, as I was saying before, the dharma of the person, the longing that they, um, in which they belong. And so instead of trying to change people's minds of, 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 on what they should think or not think, our role is more of trying to discover how they can awaken their own inner path and what can help them grow in that direction. So devotional practices. The heart is really this the in in any of these paths the heart is the the abode of, of the spiritual consciousness so the heart is not a unique component of the bhakti yoga path it is also in the karma path it is also in the jnana path the heart is where the spirit abides in us but the devotional practices tend to to relate to the heart because the feeling of love is usually felt in the chest and the love begins to grow in this area. And so uh, the, the, the main point, if you want to remember one thing about this path, very main point of it is that what grows this love is our constant turning towards it is our constant remembrance of this love over and over again. 
So we are distracted, right? In life, we 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 have a job and we do things and we become involved with them and we forget. And we forget who we are, we forget why we're here, we forget that we are, even have a spiritual path. So in the in the constant remembrance, we're bringing that sense back again and again of the lover or the love. And we marinate in them, we stay in it, we dwell in it as much as we can. So a lot of meditation in the heart, there's also the metta or the maitri meditation practices, which are practices of loving kindness um, or unconditional friendship, contemplative prayer. Um, there's also a lot of chanting and singing involved and, and joyful, joyful chanting and, and singing. Does anybody know Irina Tweedy? Of her, yeah. Okay, well, Irina Tweedy was uh, was a member of the Theosophical Society in England, and and she she had a an amazing uh, story and uh, found a teacher and um, and followed this path. And she says, in our line of work, we trust in God alone. We surrender entirely to him, and that is our sadhana, that is our practice. So this love continues to grow um, and move from the personal into the impersonal. So from the love of, of a lover or from the love of a teacher, um, it becomes the love of a um, of an avatar or the manifestation of the divine as it was Jesus, for example, or Krishna, and then eventually grows into this love for everything and love for God in all things. And finally, the path of, of action, which is actually considered to be more than a path itself, though it could be a path itself. Um, it could be like what sustains the other two paths because karma is action and there is action inevitably everywhere and in every minute of our lives, in every second of our lives, there is action. So what are the characteristics of karma yoga? As you can imagine, this one is, is more related to what we do and offering what we do without expectations, without any expectations. So offering any act of service as an offering to, um, to the greater life, to the well-being of others. Again, not from the personal to the impersonal. A description of the of the karma marga in the Bhagavad Gita says, whosoever offers to me a leaf, flower, or fruit devoutly, I accept that offering of love from the pure in heart. Whatever you do, whatever you eat, whatever you offer, whatever you give, whatever austerities you practice, all son of Kunti, Make it an offering to me. The, thus will you be freed from the pure and, in, and impure binding fruits of action. And with your mind firmly fixed on me, you will be freed and attain to me. A little bit more of an explanation of... Um, this practicing non-attachment to the results. The Bhagavad Gita says, thy business is with the action only, never with its fruits. Let not the fruit of action be thy motive, nor be thou to inaction attached. So it's not that we are asked to be inactive, we are asked to be active whenever we're called to action but never for the fruit of the action. 
never for what the what we will receive from that. And this is a very hard thing. Um, our society is so driven by the fruits of our action. Pretty much everything that we do, we do thinking of the result. And I think in the physical world, that has a purpose and a need. But in the spiritual world, what the um, Karma Marga asks of us is that we act because it is our duty. We act because it is the unfolding of, of this flower that we are. We act because for the love of it. We act because it is true to who we are. And in that action, we only think of doing the best that we can. And we leave the results to the greater life. And it doesn't matter if it goes well or not. Um, Annie Besson says, this is the true treading of the path of karma, not seeking action when it is not present, nor refusing to perform it when it is there. And... A little bit more of an explanation of this of this selfless action as an offering. Um, our brother Lawrence explains in in his experience how everything you know you'll see you you will meet people who are much more inclined to serve than to sit in meditation or to read a book that are more much more inclined to clean the lodge before everybody comes or set up the chairs or. Um, set this meeting so everybody, if others can come, then they would be willing to study or meditate or, or, or contemplate. And so for those type of people, service is a very, very important part of the path. Action is a very important part that has to be nurtured and supported. So um, Brother Lawrence said that for him, it came a point in which the greatest prayer for him was to cook and to do the dishes and to get the food for the community. That he was the closest to God when he did that. So he said, God of all the pans and pots, make me a saint while I cook and wash the dishes. Which is a, also a beautiful sentiment for all of us if we want to practice it in this way. How many times we do things that, that we don't want to do, that we don't feel like doing, but we can always think if, if we know that has to be done, if we know that it will benefit others, we can offer it. We can say, um, I, I do this and I offer it to, uh, for the benefit of all. And Annie Besant, in, in this phrase, he, she points out that no matter what happens, if it goes well, great. If it doesn't go well, it doesn't matter. As long as we uh, did it with our whole heart, as, as long as we did what we felt that had to be done, um, the, the result of that is not in our hands and it doesn't matter. So finally, I want to bring these these three to get these three paths together and first point out that they look quite similar to three pillars that that were established in in the Theosophical Society around Annie Besson's time, which are the 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 pillars of study, meditation, and service. So study very much relates to the path of wisdom. Meditation is what brings. Um, the aspect of devotion or, or part of it and service is, is related to this action. So perhaps, um, you know, the society is a home for, because the society is a home for every human being without distinctions, we all come from a little bit more predominantly from one of these paths. And we may have the other two less developed than the uh, than the one. So ideally, we once 
So here's what I, I have found in my own experience. I think that the most important thing to do first is to establish ourselves in the path that we feel more comfortable. And that once we feel that we have established ourselves in that home, as Hildegard of Bingen was saying, then we can venture any uh, into the other two. And perhaps one at a time and see, okay, now that I feel uh, at home in my own practice and in this path, how about I, I start to uh, add some elements of, of one of the other two? Uh, because in at least in the theosophical teachings, you'll find Subaru, um, I.K. Taimi, um, then Mabel Collins in, in the line on the path, saying that all these paths need to be integrated, that eventually the person who develops wisdom will develop love and service. The person who develops service will develop love and wisdom. The person who develops love, as I was showing, arrives to a point in which knowledge just flows into them through the path of love. So they all go to the same direction. Um, so there is a need for integration. Subarau says, some say that in order to attain um, Raja Yoga, and we can just replace this by saying, in order to attain union, one should investigate uh -huh, the, the Mahavakya, which is, a, which is a sacred text. So some say that in order to attain union, one should investigate this sacred text. Others, that the mind must be concentrated on a point and the, the yogi, the aspirant, must contemplate Parabrahman the, uh, um, and manifested God. Some say uh, one's own guru is the true object of contemplation, and it is enough to lead a good life. Some say that the repetition of the pranava, the repetition of the sound om, is in itself union. And others say, you must cult, uh, cultivate willpower. Which of these is the true one? And he says, all these are necessary and much more. Read light on the path. So as we read light on the path, it says, uh, there is a part that says, seek out the way, seek out the way. Seek out the way going within, seek out the way going without, and so on. And then he says, seek it not by one road. To each temperament, there is one road which seems the most desirable. But the way is not found by devotion alone, alone by religious contemplation alone, by art and progress by self-sacrificing labor, by studious observation of life. None alone can take the disciple more than one step onwards. All steps are necessary to make up the ladder. And I'm going to add to this that, <laughs> although I agree with that statement, the whole idea of making this presentation is to emphasize the importance of knowing our inner temperament and honoring that temperament, nurturing it, and helping others find their own. And know that whatever path we are walking, we are all walking in the same direction. So it's not a matter of convincing others to come to my path, but of helping others to feel more inspired and more connected to their own. Thank you. <laughs>